Famous Shoes was eating a good fat mallard duck when the Comanche boys found him. He had noticed some ducks on the South Canadian and had crept down to the water and made a clever snare during the night. His trip to the Washita had been a disappointment. He did not find his grandmother, who had gone to live on the sweet grass hills near the Arkansas River. But he did find his Aunt Nita, a quarrelsome old woman who was living with some mixed-blood trapping people in a filthy little camp. The trapping people mostly trapped skunks and muskrats. There were hides everywhere, some of them pretty smelly. The minute he arrived, his aunt began to upbraid him about a knife she had lent him years before, which he had broken accidentally. At the time, he had been trying to remove a good length of chain from an old wagon that had fallen apart on the prairies. He thought the chain might come in handy. But all the chain did was break the tip off his aunt's knife. Only the tip was broken, most of the knife would still cut, but his Aunt Nita considered that the knife was now useless and had never forgiven Famous Shoes for his carelessness. Famous Shoes only stayed on the Washita long enough to be courteous before making his way back to the South Canadian, where he discovered the little flock of fat ducks. Then the five Comanche boys showed up and began to talk about killing him. One of the boys wanted to kill him immediately just because he was a kickapoo, and another because he had scouted for Big Horse Skull. The rudest boy, though, was Blue Duck, who wanted to kill him just because he was there. Famous Shoes did not think the boys would do him much harm. In any case, he was hungry. He went on eating the duck while the boys walked around him saying ugly things. They were just boys. It was normal that they would strut around and make rude remarks. The boys had been chasing a deer when they found him, but they had lost its track. Famous Shoes had seen the deer only that morning, running east. The Comanche boys were so impatient that they had overlooked a plain track and let the deer get away. The deer had looked exhausted, too. The boys would have had it if only they had kept their minds on their business. That deer you were chasing got away, he told them. There are plenty of fat ducks on this river, though. We want to kill Big Horse today. Where is he? Blue Duck asked. He tried to cut me with the long knife, but I was too quick. A vision woman taught me how to fly, so I flew down into the canyon and got away. You are lucky you found that vision woman, Famous Shoes said. He didn't believe that Blue Duck could fly, but the boy had such a bad reputation for killing people that he thought the best thing to do was be polite, keep eating his duck, and hope to get through the morning without being shot. Blue Duck had an old rifle and kept pointing it at him as he ate, a very rude thing. You come to our camp. My father might want to torture you, Blue Duck said. He is angry because you brought Big Horse here. Big Horse is chasing Kicking Wolf, Famous Shoes informed them. He has given up and is on his way south by now. He is not going to bother your father. Nevertheless, he was forced to humor the boys. Instead of settling down, they began to threaten him with arrows. Famous Shoes decided he had better go with them. They were young boys. They might want to take a scalp just for practice. He trotted along in front of them as they made their way to the canyon. He was not worried that Buffalo Hump would torture him. Buffalo Hump owed him a debt and would never offer him violence, even though he scouted for the Texans. The debt had come about because of Buffalo Hump's grandmother, a famous prophet woman. One winter, years before, when there were few buffalo on the prairies where the Comanche hunted, the tribe had had to move north, beyond the Arkansas. The old woman's death was at hand. She was too weak to make the cold journey to the north. So, in the way of such things, she was left with a good fire and enough food to last her until her passing. Everyone said goodbye, and the band went north to seek game. But the old woman's time was slow in coming. When famous shoes chanced upon her in her little dying place on the Kitake, she was weak but still alive. Her fire was out and her food was gone, but she was restless with visions and could not die. Famous Shoes had been in Mexico and had come back to seek advice from his grandfather. But instead of finding his grandfather, he found Buffalo Hump's old grandmother and struck up a friendship with her in her last days. He stayed with her for a week, keeping her fire going through the cold nights. Famous Shoes knew that it was a delicate thing he was doing. What if the old woman got so healthy that she decided to stay alive? Then he would have an old Comanche woman on his hands, which would anger his grandfather if he ever found him. His grandfather hated two things, rainy weather and Comanches. 
Besides, for a Kickapoo to attend a Comanche at such a time was not entirely proper. Once an old one was left to die, and the farewells were said, it was their duty to go on and die. He was beginning to worry that he had got himself into a difficulty when the old woman closed her eyes and ceased to breathe. Famous shoes saw to it that her remains were treated correctly, a thing that was the duty of any traveler. Then he went on his way. When Buffalo Hump found out that famous shoes had been helpful to his grandmother in her dying, he told his warriors that the Kickapoo was to be left alone, and even made welcome at their campfires if he cared to visit. Famous Shoes was glad Buffalo Hump had given such an order. It had probably saved his life several times. Even so, he did not seek out Buffalo Hump or visit Comanche campfires. He did not think it wise. Buffalo Hump might follow the rules of courtesy, but being near him was too much like being near a bear. It was possible to come close to a bear, even a grizzly, and talk to it. The bear might allow it. But the bear was still a bear and might stop allowing the courteous talk at any time. If the bear changed his mind about how he felt, the person trying to exchange courtesies with him might be dead. Besides, for all famous shoes knew, Buffalo Hump might not have liked his grandmother very much. She might have been quarrelsome, like his Aunt Nita. Buffalo Hump's respect might have its limits. When famous shoes walked into the Comanche camp, Blue Duck rode right beside him, making his horse prance and jump. The boy wanted everyone to think he had brought in an important captive. Some of the young warriors rode up to Famous Shoes a few times to taunt him, but he ignored their taunts and went on calmly through the camp. To his surprise, he saw old Slow Tree sitting on a robe with Buffalo Hump. Slow Tree was talking, which was no surprise. Slow Tree was always talking. Buffalo Hump looked angry. No doubt the old chief had been making boring speeches to him for a long time. Slow Tree might have been bragging to Buffalo Hump about how many times he had been with his wives. He wanted everyone to believe that he was always at his women, bringing them great pleasure. Slow Tree had always been boastful, but he had once been a terrible fighter and had to be treated respectfully, even though he was old and boring. "'What are you doing here?' Buffalo Hump asked when Famous Shoes walked up. "'Your white friends were here, but now they have gone south.' The buffalo horse was here three days ago, but I don't see him today. Your son made me come, Famous Shoes replied. He came with these other boys and made me come. I was on the Canadian eating a duck. I would not have bothered you if these boys had let me alone. They said you might want to torture me a while. Buffalo Hump was amused. The Kickapoo was an eccentric person who was apt to turn up anywhere on the Yano on some outlandish errand that no other Indian would bother about. The man would walk a thousand miles to listen to a certain bird whose call he might want to mimic. Most people thought Famous Shoes was crazy, but Buffalo Hump didn't. Though a Kickapoo, the man had respect for the old ways. He behaved like the old ones behaved. The old ones, too, would go to any lengths to learn some useful fact about the animals or the birds. They would figure that someone might need to know those facts. They themselves might not need to, but their children might, or their grandchildren might. Very few Comanches would go to the trouble Famous Shoes went to when it came to seeking useful information. It made Buffalo Hump annoyed with his own people that this was so. The Kickapoos were a lowly people who had never been good at war. The Comanches wiped them out wherever they found them and did this easily. Even young boys, no more skilled than his son, could easily slaughter Kickapoos wherever he found them. Yet it was Famous Shoes, a Kickapoo, who sought the knowledge that few Comanches were now even interested in. Besides, the man was funny. He would just walk into an enemy camp and offer himself up for torture as if torture were a joke. Then Slow Tree, who was rarely polite, pointed a pipe he was smoking at Famous Shoes and made an ugly speech. If you came into my camp, I would hang you upside down and put a scorpion in your nose, he said. When the scorpion stung you, it would kill your brain. Then you could wander around eating weeds for all I care. I don't like kickapoos. Famous Shoes ignored the old man, though he decided on the spot to avoid the country where Slow Tree hunted until the old chief was finally dead. He had never heard that a scorpion bite could kill a brain. But it might be true, especially if the scorpion stung you inside your nose. 
The nose was not far from the brain. The poison of the scorpion would not have far to travel. I was on the Washita looking for my grandmother, famous Shu said, thinking it would be wise to change the subject. There are many deer in the Washita country. If you are wanting deer, that is where I would go. Blue Duck stood nearby, strutting and playing with a hatchet he wore in his belt. He wanted the band to know that he was responsible for bringing in the Kickapoo. If his father didn't appreciate it, maybe Slow Tree would. It was clear that the great chief Slow Tree had no fondness for Kickapoos. Buffalo Hump was engaged in the delicate task of being polite to Slow Tree, a man he neither liked nor trusted. He didn't need an irritating boy standing nearby playing with a hatchet. Blue Duck wanted people to think he had captured someone important, but Famous Shoes wasn't important. He was just an eccentric Kickapoo. Why did you bring this man here? he asked, looking at his son coldly. You should have left him to eat his duck. If you see him again, leave him alone. He did not want to mention the fact that Famous Shoes had helped tend his grandmother while she died. The business with his grandmother was between himself and Famous Shoes. It was not a matter he wanted to discuss with everyone. Blue Duck was shocked that his father would speak to him so in front of Slow Tree and the worthless Kickapoo. He turned away at once and caught his horse. Then he gathered up his weapons and a robe to protect him from the cold and left the camp. Buffalo Hump made no comment. Soon they saw the angry boy winding up the trail out of the canyon. If he was my son, I would let him hang you upside down and put the scorpion in your nose, Slow Tree said to Famous Shoes. Famous Shoes didn't answer. Why respond to such a stupid comment? Blue Duck was not Slow Tree's son. He thought he would probably go up the other side of the canyon when he left, though. It would be good to have the great Palo Duro Canyon between himself and the rude, angry boy. There was silence for a time. Slow Tree was annoyed because Buffalo Hump was ignoring everything he said. Buffalo Hump listened in a polite manner, but he made no move to take Slow Tree's advice. He wasn't even interested in torturing a Kickapoo, which most Comanches would do immediately without waiting for a chief's permission. My wives will feed you and then you can go. Buffalo Hump said to Famous Shoes. I had that fat duck I don't need to eat, Famous Shoes said. I had better go look for Big Horse Skull before he gets lost. Kicking Wolf is following him now, too, Buffalo Hump remarked casually. He wants to steal the buffalo horse. I better go, Famous Shoes said. The news he had just heard shocked him badly. Big Horse Skull had been following Kicking Wolf, but now it was the other way around. Of course, Kicking Wolf was already a famous horse thief. But stealing the buffalo horse would be a powerful act. If Kicking Wolf could steal the buffalo horse, his people would sing about him for many years. Famous Shoes changed his mind about eating, though. One fat duck wouldn't last him forever, and Buffalo Hump's wives had made a stew with a good smell to it. He squatted and ate a big bowlful while Buffalo Hump sat patiently on his robe, listening to old Slow Tree brag about how happy he made his wives. Jake came in the door, avoided Felice's eye, turned into the hall and started up the stairs, only to find old Ben Mickelson planted squarely in his way. Jake despised old Ben for being a disgusting, profane, purple-lipped old drunkard, but he was the Skull's butler, and it was necessary to be polite to him. It was necessary, but it wasn't easy. Old Ben was looking at Jake with a mean gleam in his watery blue eyes. Not today, you don't, you damned lout, Ben Mickelson said. Jake thought he must have misheard. Every day for three weeks he had hurried up to the Skull living quarters and been welcomed ardently by the lady of the house. Yesterday she had been particularly ardent. Inez's skull straddled him on the chaise long and bounced so vigorously that the chaise broke. Then she dragged Jake onto the couch and continued no less vigorously. By the time Madame Skull quieted down, every piece of furniture that had a flat surface had been made use of in their sport. So why was old Ben Mickelson barring his access to the stairs? Mind your words, Ben, if you don't want to lick him, Jake said. It occurred to him for a moment that the captain might be back. But if the captain was back, the boys would be back too, and he hadn't seen them. 
Not today you ain't going up, and not tomorrow, and not the next day, and not the next week, and not the next month, and not ever, old Ben said, the words bursting out of his mouth like gobbets of bile. But what's wrong? Jake asked, confused. Nothing's wrong. You just be gone now. We don't need to be seeing the likes of you around the big house again. Jake wanted to grab the old man by his scrawny neck and shake him good, but he didn't quite dare. Something was wrong, he just didn't know what. Yesterday, Madame Skull had called him Jakey and could hardly wait to get out his little pricklin', as she called it. But today, Ben Mickelson stood on the stairs looking at him in a gloating way. Be gone, Ben said again. I'll be calling the sheriff on you if you don't. The sheriff will know what to do with a lout like you, I guess. Jake was confused and disappointed. He knew the old butler hadn't just decided to dismiss him on his own authority, because he had no authority. He might curse the kitchen girls and pinch them under the stairs, but he was only a butler. Jake knew that if he wasn't allowed up, it was because Madame Skull didn't want him up. But why? He had tried to be cooperative, no matter what wild game Ina's Skull suggested, and some of her games went far beyond the bounds of anything he had ever supposed he would be doing in his life. But he had done them, and Madame Skull had yelled and kicked with pleasure. So why was the old butler now planted in his way? All right, Ben, Jake said, feeling deflated. He wandered back into the kitchen where Felice was churning butter. She didn't look up when he came in. Felice was careful never to raise her eyes to him anymore. But now he felt lonely. He'd been turned out. He would have liked to smile from Felice. He had a sense that she felt he had treated her bad, though he'd only done what he had been told to do by the captain's wife. Felice had no cause to turn her head every time he entered the room. Well, I guess the missus ain't up, he said, idling for a moment. I'd sure like a glass of buttermilk before I go to work. Felice got up without a word and poured him a tumbler full of buttermilk from the big crock where they kept it. Captain Skull, too, liked buttermilk. He'd been known to drink off a quart on days when he came in with a thirst for buttermilk. Jake thanked Felice, thinking it might melt a reserve, but Felice went back to her churning without even a nod. Jake was sitting on the back step, drinking buttermilk and wondering what he could find to do all day, when Ina's skull strode out of the house. She had on her riding habit and was pulling on a glove. When she saw Jake sitting on the step with a tumbler of buttermilk, she did not look pleased. "'Who told you to sit on my stoop and guzzle my buttermilk?' she asked, her black eyes snapping. Jake was taken aback by her look, which was icy, and her tone, which was hot. He jumped to his feet in embarrassment. "'I suppose you got the buttermilk from that yellow bitch,' she said. "'I'll quirt her soundly when I get back.' "'Why, the crock was full. I thought I could drink one glass,' Jake said, very nervous. "'That's the captain's buttermilk. It's not for common use,' Inez said." I instructed the butler to inform you that we didn't need you around here anymore. I suppose I'll have to whack that old sod a time or two if he forgot to tell you. He told me I was just resting a minute, Jake said, confused by the coldness in Madame Skull's tone. Only yesterday she had pressed hot affections on him. Today she acted as if she scarcely knew him. Get off my step, I told you, Inez said. I don't want you around here. And stay away from that yellow bitch, too. I don't want you indulging in any irregularities with the servants. Madame Skull poked him, not gently, with the toe of her riding boot. Jake jumped up and hurried down the steps. Then he remembered that he still had the tumbler in his hand. "'I thought you liked me,' he blurted out. Madame Skull's lip curled. "'Like you? A common thing such as yourself? I've stooped to many follies, but I doubt I'd allow myself to like a common farm boy,' she said." Jake sat the tumbler on the step where Felice would find it and take it in. He was walking slowly and sadly back down the main street of Austin, trying to puzzle out why he had been welcome one day and shunned the next, when he heard a horse galloping close behind him. Madame Skull was coming on her fine thoroughbred Lord Nelson. The horse was worth as much as a house, some of the rangers claimed. Two men stood guard over Lord Nelson all night at the Skull stables, lest Indians try to sneak in and steal him. Madame Skull raced Lord Nelson over the prairies at full speed, usually alone. 
As Inez's skull came abreast of Jake, she drew rein and ran her quirt lightly through his hair, which she herself had just cut the day before with her scissors after their sweaty sport. It was the curls, Jakey, Inez said, the ice still in her voice. She flicked her quirt again through his short hair. The curls, she said. I suppose I found them briefly appealing, but then I cut them off. So that's all done now, ain't it? Then she put the spurs to Lord Nelson and went galloping straight out of town. Kicking Wolf could move without sound. When he decided to steal the buffalo horse, he only took three birds with him. Except for himself, three birds was the quietest warrior in the band. Fast Boy and Red Badger were brave fighters, but clumsy. They could not approach a horse herd in the soundless way that was required if a tricky theft was being contemplated. Kicking Wolf prayed every night that he could keep his grace with animals. Few Comanches could go into a horse herd at night without alarming the horses. Buffalo Hump could not do such delicate work, not at all. He was a great raider, Kicking Wolf acknowledged. Buffalo Hump could run off many horses and kill whatever white men or Mexicans got in his way. But he could not go into a horse herd at night and steal a mare or a stallion. He was too impatient, and he did not bother to disguise his smell. Mainly he was a fighter, not a thief. Kicking Wolf, though, was very careful about his smell, and he had instructed three birds how to eliminate his odor before going into a horse herd. Kicking Wolf would eat little for a day or two before a raid. He wanted his body to empty out its smells. Then he gathered herbs and rubbed them on himself, on his armpits, on his privates, on his feet. He chewed sweet roots to make his breath inoffensive. He prepared carefully, but mainly it was his grace, his ability to move without sound, that enabled him to go into a herd of strange horses at night and not alarm them. He wanted to be able to move close to the horses and stroke them. He wanted the stroking to begin before the horse was even aware that a man was there. Once he had the horse's trust, he could move through the herd, seeing that all the horses stayed calm. It was important to start with a horse that had calmness in him. Often Kicking Wolf would study a horse herd for a few days until he had selected the horse that he would approach first. It had to be a horse with calmness in it, a horse unlikely to panic. Once Kicking Wolf had chosen the first horse, he would pray in the morning that his grace would not desert him. Then he could move into the herd with confidence and stroke the lead horse. He liked a night that was cloudy, but not entirely moonless when he went to steal horses. He wanted to be able to see where the ground was, and so would the horses. In complete darkness, a horse might brush up against a thorn bush and panic if it rattled. A whole herd might break into a run in an instant if they heard a strange sound. Kicking Wolf was proud of being the best of the Comanche horse thieves. He had honed his skills for many years. Simply stealing many horses had never been enough for him. He only wanted to steal the best horses, the horses that would run the fastest or make the best studs. He wanted to steal the horses that the Texans would miss most. Plow horses he never touched. Invariably, when he got back to camp with the horses he had stolen, the other warriors would be jealous. Even Buffalo Hump was a little jealous, although he pretended not to notice Kicking Wolf and his horses. The other warriors always offered to trade Kicking Wolf for his horses. They would offer him guns or their ugly old wives, or even occasionally a young pretty wife. But Kicking Wolf never traded. He kept his horses, and because of them was envied by every warrior in the tribe. From the moment Kicking Wolf first saw the buffalo horse, he wanted to steal it. The buffalo horse was the most famous horse in Texas. If he could steal such an animal, it would make the Texans look puny. It would shame their greatest warrior, Big Horse Skull. It would bring glory back to the Comanche people. The women and the young men would all make songs about Kicking Wolf. The medicine men could take piss from the buffalo horse and use it in potions that would make the young men brave and the women amorous. Buffalo Hump would sulk, for he would know that Kicking Wolf had done a great thing, a thing he himself could never have done. When he saw that the Texans were not going to go chase him to the Rio Pecos, he rested for three days in a little cave he had found. He built a warm fire and feasted on the tender meat of one of the young mares he had killed. 
Then he heard from Red Badger that Blue Duck had attacked the Texans with a few young warriors and killed one ranger. Red Badger was so fond of one of the young women who had come to the camp with Slow Tree that he could not stay in one place. He was in love with the young woman who was the wife of Old Skinny Hand. Though Old Skinny Hand was a violent fighter, Red Badger had to be careful, for Skinny Hand would certainly shoot him if he caught him slipping out with his young wife. Red Badger said that Buffalo Hump was bored with Slow Tree, but was trying to be polite. Kicking Wolf soon got almost as bored with Red Badger as Buffalo Hump was with Slow Tree. Red Badger was a foolish person who was so crazy about women that he could not accomplish much as a warrior. He talked about women so much that everyone who had to listen to him was bored. Fast Boy was so bored that he wanted to tie Red Badger up and cut out his tongue. Everyone was almost that bored, but of course they could not simply cut out a warrior's tongue. The fact that it was so cold made Kicking Wolf decide that it might be a good time to steal the buffalo horse. The Texans did not like cold. They did not know how to shelter themselves and keep themselves warm, as he was doing in his little cave. When it was cold, the Texans all huddled around fires and went to sleep. New snowflakes were falling outside his little cave. It was not going to be warm for many days. Even if the Texans went on south across the Llano, the cold and sleet would follow them. With the weather so cold, the Texans would not be very watchful of the horses. At night, Skull hobbled the buffalo horse, but did not keep it on a grazing rope. Once Kicking Wolf had called the buffalo horse by whistling at him. He whistled twice, and the big horse came trotting right to him. Kicking Wolf also noticed that the buffalo horse was very alert. If a wolf crossed the prairie or even a coyote, the buffalo horse would be the first to raise its head and look. It did not whinny, though, like some of the younger horses who might be frightened by the smell of a wolf. The buffalo horse had no reason to fear wolves or anything else on the Yano. When the morning dawned, gray as sleet, Kicking Wolf walked a mile from his cave and sat on a low hill to pray. When he had prayed some hours, he went back to camp and told the few warriors there that he had decided to steal the buffalo horse. It was a plan he had never mentioned to anyone. The warriors were so surprised that they could not think of any words to say. It was such a bold idea that everyone was a little scared, even Fast Boy. Kicking Wolf was a great horse stealer, they all knew that. But the buffalo horse was a special horse. He was the horse of Skull, the terrible captain with the long knife. What would Skull do if he woke up to find his great horse missing? We will all go with you, Red Badger said after a few minutes' thought. Three birds will go with me, Kicking Wolf said, no one else. Red Badger wanted to go. Stealing the buffalo horse was a great and audacious thing. Any warrior would want to help do such a great thing. But the firm way Kicking Wolf had spoken caused Red Badger to swallow his protests. Kicking Wolf had spoken in a way that did not invite disagreement. Fast Boy had meant to say something also, but Kicking Wolf had such a cold look in his eye that Fast Boy did not speak. Where will you take the buffalo horse when you steal him? Red Badger asked. The more he thought about what Kicking Wolf planned, the more his breath came short. It was a big thing to steal such an animal. Many of the Comanches thought the buffalo horse was a witch horse. Some even thought it could fly. Some of the old women claimed they had heard the whinny of a great horse coming from high up in the sky on dark nights when there was no moon. I will take him to Mexico, Kicking Wolf said, to the Sierra Perdida. Ah, the Sierra Perdida, Red Badger said. I don't know if the Texans will follow you that far. If they try to follow us past the Brazos, you can shoot them. Kicking Wolf added. It was a little joke. Red Badger had a repeating rifle of which he was very proud. He cleaned it and rubbed it every night. But Red Badger had weak eyesight. He couldn't hit anything with his rifle. Once he had even missed a buffalo that had been laying down. Red Badger's poor vision made the buffalo seem as if it were standing up, so he kept shooting over it. In battle, he shot wildly, hitting no one. Some of the warriors were even afraid Red Badger might accidentally shoot one of them. He would not be the one to protect them from the Texans if they followed past the Brazos. Fast Boy was taken aback by Kicking Wolf's statement about the Sierra Perdida. 
Those mountains were the stronghold of Ahumado, the dark-skinned bandit whom the whites called the Black Vaquero, because he was so cruel and also because he was so good at stealing cattle from the big ranches of the Texans down below the Nueces River. Ahumado hated the Texans and killed them in many cruel ways. But what made Kicking Wolf's statement startling was that he also hated Comanches. When he caught Comanches, he killed them with tortures just as bad as those he visited on the Texans. The Black Vaquero lives in the Sierra Perdida, Fastboy reminded Kicking Wolf. He is a bad old man. That is where I am going, the Sierra Perdida, Kicking Wolf repeated, and then he was silent. Fastboy didn't say more, mainly because he knew that it was easy to put Kicking Wolf in a bad mood by questioning his decisions. He was far worse than Buffalo Hump in that regard. Buffalo Hump didn't mind questions from his warriors. He wanted the men he fought with to understand what they were supposed to do, and he gave careful orders. Problems with Buffalo Hump would come only if the orders were not carried out properly. If some warrior failed to do his part in a raid, then Buffalo Hump's anger would be terrible. With Kicking Wolf, though, it was unwise to rush in with questions, even though what he wanted to do seemed crazy. Stealing the buffalo horse was a little crazy, but then Kicking Wolf was a great stealer of horses and could probably manage it. But the really crazy part of his plan was taking the horse to Ahumado's country, a thing that made no sense at all. Even Buffalo Hump was careful to avoid the Sierra Perdida when he raided into Mexico. It was not from fear, Buffalo Hump feared nothing, but from practicality. In the Sierra Perdida, or the villages near it, there were no captives to take, because Ahumado had already taken all the children from the villages there. If he did not keep the captives as slaves, he traded them north to the Apaches. Some people even speculated that Ahumado himself was Apache, but famous shoes, the Kickapoo, who went everywhere, said no, Ahumado was not an Apache. Ahumado is from the south, famous shoes said. When questioned about the statement, famous shoes could not be more specific. He did not know what tribe Ahumado belonged to, only that it was from the south. From the south, where the jungle is, he said. None of the Comanches knew the word, so Famous Shoes explained that the jungle was a forest, where it rained often, and where Jaguar, the great cat, hunted. That was all Famous Shoes knew. Fast Boy did not ask any more questions, but he thought he ought to make his views clear about the foolish thing Kicking Wolf wanted to do. Fast Boy was a warrior, a veteran of many battles with the whites and with the Mexicans. He had a right to speak his mind. If we go into the Sierra Perdida, Ahumado will kill us all, he said. Kicking Wolf merely looked at him coldly. If you are afraid of him, you don't have to go, Kicking Wolf said. I am not afraid of him, and I know I don't have to go, Fast Boy said. I don't have to go anywhere except to look for something to eat. I wanted you to know what I think. Red Badger was of the same opinion as Fast Boy, but he didn't want to state his views quite so plainly. Once I was in Mexico and a bad thorn stuck in my knee, he said. It was a green thorn. It went in behind my knee and almost ate my leg off. That thorn was more poisonous than a snake. He paused. No one said anything. Ever since then I have not liked going to Mexico, Red Badger added. You don't have to go either, Kicking Wolf said. Once Three Birds and I have the buffalo horse, we will go alone to Mexico. Three birds looked at the sky. He had heard some geese and looked up to see if he could spot them. He was very fond of geese and thought that if the geese were planning to stop somewhere close by, he might go and try to snare one. The geese were there, all right, many geese, but they would not be stopping anywhere nearby. They were very high, almost as high as the clouds. No one else had even noticed them. But three birds had good hearing and could always hear geese when they were passing over, even if they were high near the clouds. He made no comment about the business of Mexico. It seemed risky to him, but if Kicking Wolf wanted to go, that was enough for three birds. When there was discussion, he rarely spoke his thoughts. He liked to keep his own thoughts inside him and not mix them up promiscuously with the thoughts of other warriors or of women or of anyone. His thoughts were his. He didn't want them out in the air. Because of the firm way he stuck to his preference and kept his thoughts inside himself, some Comanches thought he was a mute. They thought he was too dumb to talk and were puzzled that Kicking Wolf put so much stock in his ability. 
Sometimes even Kicking Wolf himself was annoyed by Three Birds' silence, his unwillingness to give an opinion. What is wrong with you? he asked Three Birds one time. You never speak. Where are your words? Are you so ignorant that you have forgotten all your words? Three Birds had been a little offended by Kicking Wolf's rude speech. When Kicking Wolf asked him that question, Three Birds got up and left the camp for a week. He saw no reason to stay around if Kicking Wolf was going to be rude to him. He had not forgotten his words and would speak them when he felt like it. He did not feel he had to speak idle words just because Kicking Wolf had decided that he was in a mood to hear him speak. What Three Birds saw when he looked in the sky, besides the geese that were not stopping, was that it was going to get even colder than it had been. It was going to stay very cold for a while yet. There would be more snow and more sleet. When will you steal the buffalo horse? Red Badger asked. Red Badger was the opposite of Three Birds. He could not hold in his questions or stay quiet for long. Red Badger often talked even when he had nothing to say that anyone at all would want to hear. Kicking Wolf didn't answer the loquacious young warrior. He was thinking of the South and of how angry Big Horse Skull would be when he woke up and discovered that his great war horse was gone.